This is OCR 2020 paper three, Unifying Physics. And I can share the paper on screen because OCR are cool. Links to the paper and mark scheme are below. Here we go. Ball coated with conducting paint has a weight of that and a radius of that. The ball is suspended. The distance between the pivot and the center of the ball is the, that. Okay, so that's the length of the string. The ball is connected. Oh my days, lots of stuff going on here. Okay, so we're given a separation of the place and we've been given the voltage as well. So I'll tell you what, shall we find the electric field strength? Start actually getting somewhere. So 4,000 divided by 0 0.08. Okay, so that gives us 50,000 uh, volts per meter. Let's go to Newton's per coulomb. Seeing that we've been given a charge there, so we're probably going to have to use that. Let's have a look. Oh, there we go. Show the electric forces about that. So we know what the electric field strength is. We said that that is 50,000, so 5 times 10 to the 4 newtons per coulomb. We know that force is equal to EQ, just from the units, newtons per coulomb, don't we? So that is 5 times 10 to the 4 times 9 times 10 to the minus 9. Oh yeah, we don't need to calculate it for this, so this just gives us times 10 to the minus 5. So that gives us 45 times 10 to the minus 5, or in other words, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. Draw on the diagram above arrows, which represent the three forces acting on the ball. Label each arrow with the name of the force it represents. Okay, so we know we have weight pulling down. We have tension due to the string. And then we can see that it's been attracted towards the negative plate here. That's the electric force. No, 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 electric force. By taking moments about the pivot, show that X is equal to 1.8 centimeters. Interesting. Okay. By taking moments? What? Do you really want to take moments there? I don't think so. I think we want to use trig. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Okay, so we have this triangle. So we know that, yes, this is 120 centimeters. But let's think about forces, shall we? So we have here pulling down our weight of, what was it? 0 0.03 Newton, 0 0.03. And then we have the force going sideways, and that is going to be 4.5 times 7 minus 4, like we said. Okay, so we know the triangle of forces is going to be the same as the triangle of the distances. So we have 120 centimeters here. We're looking for this, I'll tell you what, let's call this theta here. That's theta there as well. We're looking for this x. Uh, let's look at the right hand side first. We have the opposite and the adjacent, so we can say tan theta is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 3 times 10 to the minus 2. Should we say that? So say that to minus 2. So basically 0 0.045 divided by 3. Therefore, theta ends up being 0 0.859. Here we have the hypotenuse and the opposite, so therefore we're going to say sine of 0 0.859 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so therefore we're just going to times that by that. So 120 times the sine of our answer from before, and we end up with 1.799 centimeters or 1.8 centimeters. So how have they done it then? So they've gone with forces, they've gone with moments. Is that a better way of doing it? Let's have a look. So here we have the electric forces going anti-clockwise. The weight is technically going clockwise because it is pulling around this way if we're talking about this being the pivot, etc. But they're not 90 degrees next to each other. So what they've said is that the weight times that distance x is equal to the electric force times the length of 1.2 meters. <sighs> hmm, okay. Does that actually work? See, I'm not convinced about that, I've got to be honest, because... Yes, X and the weight are perpendicular to each other. Right, and I think this is where they've ever so slightly done a bit of a fudge, if you ask me. Because then if we're looking at the electric force going to the forces line of action, that's going to be it there. So it's not going to be 120 centimeters. It's going to be ever so slightly out, isn't it? So yeah, I, I don't think it works because you can't just say that that's true because... 120, if they say that this is 120, and they do, 120 centimetres, 
then they're basically saying that that's uh, the perpendicular distance to the force. I don't think that's right. I think they might have made a little bit of a mistake there. Either it's a mistake or they've um, just done an approximation because it's a very small angle. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. Fine. The ball is still positively charged. So now the plates are moved towards each other while still connected. Place to stop when the separation is five centimeters. Explain the effect this has on the deflection of the ball. Explain why the ball eventually starts to oscillate between the plates. Okay, so what was the original distance? Eight centimeters there. So V constant, but D decreases. Therefore, the electric field strength increases. It's because we're divided by the distance, so therefore it decreases. Therefore, force increases as well. And X is now technically greater than, f well, we should say 2.5 centimeters, shouldn't we? I guess, should we do a calculation? We probably should. So if it's five centimeters, let's do it. So F is proportional to E, which is proportional to one over D. So we can forget about that. Therefore, force one, distance one equals force two, distance two. There we go. So what do we say the first force was? Uh, 4.5 times 10 to the minus four times that by, well, it was five times it by five divided by, times by eight divided by five. That gives us 7.2 times 10 to the minus four Newtons. Okay, so if that's the case, just putting in the number in here, we actually now end up with a different angle, of course, but now we end up with 2.9 centimeters. So X is now 2.9 centimeters, which is greater than 2.5 centimeters. Therefore, of course, the ball touches the negative plate. Its charge becomes negative and it is attracted to positive plate. Cycle repeats. See when the ball oscillates, the current is that, the charge of that moves across the gap between the plates each time the ball makes one complete oscillation. Calculate the frequency F of the oscillations of the ball. So 3.2 times 10 to the minus eight amps, which is of course coulombs per second. So actually, seeing that we're just looking for hertz, just per second, can't we just do this divided by nine times 10 to the minus nine coulombs and just leave us with seconds to the minus one? I reckon we can. Sure enough, gives us 3.6 hertz. Cheeky little shortcut there. Yeah, she could have found the time period. How long does it take to go across and all that jazz, then do one over that. But uh, yeah, units are your friends. Two diagram below shows circuit two capacitors, both initially uncharged. Okay, we're charging it. Fine, fine, fine. Switch S is then moved to position B, the initial charge stored in the capacitors of capacitance. Uh, okay, so the charge is then shared between the two. Okay, so we know that uh, when it's charged, we can say that Q equals VC, but uh, in this case, we're talking EC0. Then when we discharge through the other capacitor, etc., the charge is then shared, but uh, charge is constant, of course, total charge is constant. Therefore, we can say that charge at the beginning is then equal to Q1 plus Q2 afterwards, if we're calling this uh, that and that. And so that's going to be equal to, well, ECO is equal to VCO, because they're both going to have the same PD, aren't they, plus VC. Of course, we can factorize this. Therefore, ECO is equal to VCO plus C. And then just rearranging this, of course, we can see that we end up with the final version. Just putting CO plus C over the other side. E times CO over C plus CO. So it's just all about figuring out that what's constant in this case. Of course, it's the charge. So the total charge is going to be added up. B student wants to determine values of V by repeating the experiment above and measuring blah, 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 blah. Student decides to plot one over V against C. Use the expression in A to show the graph would have a straight line of gradient Y, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so therefore, if we plot a graph of one over V against C, then, well, one over V is gonna be equal to the opposite of this. So one over E times C plus CO over CO. So all I've done is flip the whole thing. Uh, yeah, so this looks pretty good, I guess. Uh, okay, I guess we could just pop the E underneath there, couldn't we? Fine. So let's split this up. We need to multiply this out, don't we? So 
we end up with C over E C O plus C O over E C O. And of course they cancel. So we end up with one over E. There we go. So this is our Y and this is our X. And that means that one over E C O has to be our gradient plus C. That's it. Therefore, M equals gradient equals one over E C O. C equals one over E. Easy peasy. Data points, error bars, blah, 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 blah. Okay, the gradient of the line of best fit is that. The value of E is that. Determine the value of C in millifarads. Write your answer to two sig figs. So we need to find the gradient. So we said the gradient was equal to one over C zero E. Therefore, just swapping these two round, C zero is gonna be equal to one divided by E times the gradient. So one over 9.1 1 times, oh, they've already given us the gradient. Cool. So that gives us 0 0.0022 farads, but we're looking for millifarads. So that's 2.2 millifarads. So that's our answer. Draw on the graph a straight line of worst fit. Straight line of worst fit still has to go through all of the error bars. So I'm going to go for a low value, I think. So something like that. No, not even close, because it needs to hit a maximum somewhere. So I'm going to say it's going to be like that. That looks pretty good. Uh, they've made it fairly easy on us because it's going to hit the ends of the first and the last error bars there. Of course, you will use a ruler. So I end up with a gradient of 59. So if we're looking for an absolute uncertainty in C0, then therefore let's find out what that is. C0 is equal to one over 9.1 .1 times 59. And this time that gives us, well, 1.9 times 10 to the minus three. Or in other words, 1.9 millifarads. Therefore, the uncertainty is going to be 2.2, take away 1.9, so that's 0 0.3 millifarads. That's not absolute uncertainty. Experiment is repeated with a resistor of 10 kilo ohms, placed between S and the capacitor of capacitance C0. State with a reason what effect it would have on the experiment, so it would have no effect on final charge on capacitors will only affect rate of flow of charge and therefore rate of charging and discharging. Three questions about the sun and its radiation. Use the data below, so we need to show it has a luminosity of that. We have the radius of the sun and we have the surface temperature of the sun. Cool. We know that luminosity is equal to Stefan's constant times the area times temperature to the power of four. So that's just going to be Stefan constant, that's six, seven times seven minus eight times, well, it's four pi r squared, isn't it? For surface of a sphere, times by that to the power of four. Could tidy up powers of 10, but not much points in that we have a power of four in there. And we end up with 3.95 times 10 to the 26. Or watts, because it is effectively a power. Why so serious? The brightest star in the night sky has a luminosity 25 times greater than that of the sun. It has a diameter 1.7 times greater than that of the sun. Calculate the surface temperature of Sirius. Okay, so let's crack out our equation again. So we're looking for T ultimately. So we're going to say... So we can say luminosity is proportional to a t to the power of four, but because a is equal to four pi r squared, then therefore we can say that luminosity is actually proportional to r squared t to the power of four. And of course we can just replace that with d, can't we? Therefore we can say that L1 over L2 is equal to d1 squared over d2 squared. I'll tell you what, we can just factorize that times t1 to the four divided by t2 to the four. We're looking for this ultimately. Do I have to flip it all? Can I just be lazy? Let's just be lazy. Let's say that this is Sirius and this is the sun. There we go. So therefore we can say that this is 25 because Sirius is 25 times greater. And it has a diameter 1.7 times greater. So 1.7 squared. It's just a ratio, isn't it? 
So in times up by, well, if we're looking for that on top, t to the 4 divided by, what was it for the sun? 5,800 to the power of 4. So therefore, just rearranging this, we end up with t to the 4 is equal to 25 times our 5,800 to the power of 4 divided by 1.7 squared. There is a bit of a shortcut here. I could just fourth root it and say it's 5,800. But seeing that we've got so many things in here, we might as well just do it all in one go. So divide by 1.7 squared. And then we fourth root that. And we end up with 9,900. And let's go to 50. Let's go to three sig figs. B, student attends a lecture about the sun and makes the following notes. The sun loses more than that many kilograms of mass every second to maintain its luminosity. Treating hydrogen nuclei as an ideal gas, temperature of 10 to the 10 Kelvin provides kinetic energy of about 1 mega electron volts, which is necessary for fusion. However, the sun's core temperature is only 10 to the 7 Kelvin, so the chance of protons fusing on the collision is very small. This explains why the sun has such a long lifetime. Explain the principles of physics which are involved in each of these three points. You should include relevant formulae, but no numbers or calculations are required. What an interesting question. Nightmarish, but interesting. Okay, so during fusion, mass is turned into energy. Therefore, mass is lost. I mean, is that okay for that one? No, let's keep going. Tell you what, let's leave a little bit of space if I think of something else a little bit later on. Number two, what was it? Treating hydrogen temperature of 10 to the 10. Yeah, so we need to make sure that nuclei require high enough kinetic energy to get close enough to within range of strong nuclear force to fuse. And we can say as they need to overcome electrostatic repulsion. Uh, I guess we could say that uh, we have hydrogens being built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. That's a point as well, I guess we could say. Uh, necessary equations. Uh, I guess we could say that EK is equal to 3 halves KT because we can say that EK is therefore proportional to T. Fine. Uh, I guess we haven't put a, an equation up here, have we? We could say, of course, that E is equal to delta MC squared. I guess we could also say that luminosity, because it is just a power ultimately as watts, isn't it, is equal to delta mc squared per second. So if we're looking for that, if that's mass per second, we could say, therefore, mass change per second is equal to the luminosity divided by c squared. Difficult one to get. Wouldn't be surprised if you didn't get that. To be honest, I'm not sure I would have thought about that. Uh, what else can we say? Um, we could say it's about three femtometers, range of the strong nuclear force. Because there's so much that we could say here, isn't there? Okay, what about our third statement then? So number three, cause temperature is that. So the chance of protons fusing on collision is very small. Um, so 10 to the 10 divided by 10 to the 7 is equal to 1,000. Therefore, nuclei in core have 1,000 the energy, kinetic energy, and therefore temperature as those at surface. I guess we could say if... These underwent fusion, lifetime would be shorter due to, well, it would be a higher luminosity ultimately, wouldn't it? More mass lost per second. Well, that do. Yeah, there we go. So I'll do. There's a couple of more points. You might have, you might want to have a look at the mark scheme. But those are the sort of main points there, me thinks. For the ISS, orbits the height of that above the Earth's surface. We need to be careful with that, don't we? Radius of the Earth is that. Uh, I'll tell you what, shall we find out the radius then of uh, the space station? It's going to be 6.37 times 10 to the 6 plus, I'll tell you what, let's just say 0 0.41 times 10 to the 6. So that gives us 6.78 times 10 to the 6 meters. We know we're going to have to use that at some point. Gravitational field strength, G is an so this is that. Both the ISS and the astronauts that are in free fall explain why this makes the astronauts feel weightless. The reason you feel weightless is because there is no contact force or reaction force, we could say, between astronauts and surfaces in the ISS. Calculate the value of the gravitational field strength G at the height of the ISS above the Earth. Ah, I told you we need it. So we know that G is equal to GM over R squared, that is. So therefore, G is proportional to 1 over R squared. Therefore, G1 R1 squared is equal to G2 R2 squared. 
we're looking for G2. So therefore, that's going to be equal to G1 times the ratio of our distances, our radii from the center of the Earth. They have to be, of course. Of course, we can factorize, can't we? So that's going to be 9.8. Did I go 9.81? Yep. Times by, uh, what was it? At the Earth, 6.37. I don't think we need to deal with. No, we don't. We can just forget about powers of 10 because it's all relative. And that is going to be squared. That gives us 8.8. Six six newtons per kilogram. Speed of the ISS is about seven point seven kilometers per second. So the period of the ISS in its orbit is about that. Right. What do we say the radius was? So six point seven eight times ten to the six. Six point seven eight times ten to the six meters. So that's our radius. We know that well if we've got a speed that's v. Period. We know it's going to be something to do with omega, don't we? We know that V equals omega R, and omega is equal to 2 pi F, or 2 pi over T. So for just swapping around V and T, we end up with time period that's equal to 2 pi R over V. So this is 2 pi times 6.78 times 10 to the 6, divided by well, 7,700, isn't it, meters per second? I could cancel powers of 10. Uh, so I'll tell you what I am going to. So 2 pi times, well, 6,780 divided by 7.7. .7. We end up with 5,532 seconds. We, of course, want that in minutes. So divide that by 60, and that gives us 92 minutes. C, use the information in B and the data below to show that the root mean square, speed of the air molecules inside the ISS, is approximately 15 times smaller than the orbital speed of the ISS. That's so bizarre. Okay, so temperature, first of all, is going to be in Kelvin. We want that in, so that's going to be 293 Kelvin. We have molar mass of air. We're looking for CRMS, aren't we? What a weird question. Okay, we have a temperature, so we know we're going to have to use 3 halves kT, right? Always the case. And then we know that's equal to half mv squared, or CRMS squared. I'm just going to call it C squared. So therefore, we can, of course, say, cancelling the twos, that C squared is equal to 3kT over M. So we have the temperature, but now we need to know what the mass of one molecule is. We have the molar mass, and so therefore we just divide by Avogadro's, don't we, to find the actual mass of one molecule. So divide by 6.02 times 10 to the 23, and that gives us 4.82 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. So popping this all in, therefore, we end up with square root of 3 times Boltzmann constant times our temperature and divide that by the mass of a molecule. Then we can sort out some powers of 10 here. So minus 26 on the bottom, so and up to the top, we just end up with times 10 to the 3. So it's just going to be square root of 3 times, well, 1,380 times 293 divided by 4.82. And we end up with, what do you know, speed of 500 meters per second. Bang on. Uh, we're looking for 15 times smaller, therefore we can just say 7,700, which is what we saw earlier, divided by 500. That does give us 15.4. DISS has arrays of solar cells on its wings. Solar cells charge batteries with power, blah, 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 blah. The total area is that we have only 7% of the energy is stored in the battery, so that's our efficiency. Intensity is that. 1,000, let's say 1,400 watts per meter squared outside of the Earth's shadow and zero inside it. The ISS passes through the Earth's shadow for 35 minutes during each orbit. Tell you what, should we times it up by 60? So we're ready. So 2,100 seconds. Okay, so we're gonna, oh, we are actually being asked to calculate the average power delivered to the batteries. So we have intensity, that's equal to power divided by area. If we're looking for power, then it's going to be intensity times the area. So that's going to be our 1,400 times the 2,500, but we are going to times by 0 0.07, it's only 7%. So that gives us a power of 2.45 times 10 to the 5 watts. Okay, so that's the power, that's, that's the energy every second while it's in the sun, but it's only in the sun for, well, it's in the shadow for, 35 minutes, so we said it was 92 minutes for a full orbit. 
And so that gives us 57 minutes. So if we then times this by the ratio of how long it's in the sun for compared to the whole orbit, that gives us 1.52 times 10 to the 5 watts. Five, this question is about EM waves. We have vertically polarized EM waves, which travels vertically towards. Wavelength is that. Shows a short section of the oscillating electric field, blah, 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 blah. Calculate the frequency of the transmitted wave. Super easy. V or C equals F lambda. Therefore, frequency is going to be speed divided by wavelength. So it's 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by, what was it, 0 0.6. Don't think I need to calculate it for that. That's going to be 5 times 10 to the 8 hertz. B, the EM wave is caused by electrons oscillating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Calculate the maximum acceleration of an electron which oscillates with an amplitude of that. No way. So that's our amplitude. We're looking for the maximum acceleration. So let's get out our equation. A is equal to minus. We don't really care about the minus. Omega squared X. So therefore, if we're looking for the max acceleration, then that's going to be amplitude. So it's going to be that. Of course, we know that omega is equal to 2 pi F. So therefore... Acceleration, I'm just going to say acceleration now. It's equal to 4 pi squared. I'm just going to square it all times A. We're looking for, well, we are looking for that. So that's nice and easy. So that's going to be 4 pi squared times, what do we say? 5 times 10 to the 8 squared times by the amplitude, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 6. Could sort out powers of 10, but I can't be bothered. Oh, actually, do you know what? I oh, am. Yeah because I'm a nerd like that. So that gives us 20, because I think we've got nice numbers as well. 25 times 10 to the 16, times by 4 times 10 to the minus 6. So these cancel to just make times 10 to the 10, but then 4 times 25 gives us 100. 100 times 10 to the 10, so basically that ends up being then 12. can get rid of that. So pi squared times 4 times 10 to the 12, that gives us 3.9 times 10 to the 13 meters per second squared. So that's why the diode is necessary for an ammeter to detect a signal in the receiver aerial. It's because the current produced is alternating. Therefore, without diode, average current of zero will be measured. Wouldn't work. D student carries out two investigations with these EM waves. Investigation one, the student rotates the receiver by the horizontal axis. First going to the metal sheet behind the receiver aerial, or behind the aerial, right, right, right. Moves the sheet weight back and forth. Okay, for each of these two investigations, explain why the ammeter sometimes gives a maximum reading and sometimes a zero reading. State the orientations of the receiver in investigation one and the positions of metal sheet in investigation two, where these maximum and zero readings would occur. Okay, when receiver is orientated in the same plane as transmitter, polarized waves will be absorbed. So we have a max current at that point. When at 90 degrees, it will have reduced to zero. Next. Okay, we're sort of answering B at the same time, but whatever. So the metal sheet causes waves to reflect back to the receiver or the aerial, and both waves interfere. We can say they undergo superpositioning. So there's our transmitter, there's our little aerial, there's our reflective sheet. Of course, it all depends on, well, this is going to be the same. That wave's going to be the same there, but then it depends how much further does it go in order to come back. At what point does it come back? Is it in phase or is it out of phase? We could talk about it in terms of stationary waves, but actually, do you know what? It's probably easier just to talk about it in terms of path difference, to be honest. So we have this distance here, don't we? Okay, so let's think about this. 2 times d is equal to the path difference. So when path difference, pd, path difference, is equal to lambda, and that is, of course, i.e. distance is equal to lambda over 2, waves arrive in phase, therefore constructive interference occurs. And that's when we have the max current. And we can say same for any distance where d is equal to n lambda over 2. But when the distance is equal to, well... We're looking for odd numbers of lambda divided by 2. Waves arrive in antiphase, or let's say arrive pi radians out of phase. Therefore, destructive interference occurs. Therefore, zero current. Or we should say min. Probably not going to be zero, is it? Because the amplitudes aren't going to be the same, but whatever. Zero current 
Oh, actually, did I say that in the mark scheme? As reflected wave intensity will be less than incident wave. Here we go. Fed up of answering that question. Right, number six. Beam of alpha particles is incident on a thin gold foil. Most pass through, blah, 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 60 degrees. Another alpha particle is deflected by 30 degrees. Sketch its path onto the diagram above. That's deflecting less, so therefore it's going to be like above here, and then it's going to go something like that, isn't it? The distance between the alpha particle and the nucleus. Calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force between the alpha particle and the gold nucleus when it's at this point. F is equal to K Q Q over R squared. K is of course nine times ten to the nine, but it's one over four pi epsilon zero. But this is such a good shortcut. So uh, it's seventy nine protons in the gold and two protons in the helium. But tell you what, I'm going to do that then times by one point six times ten to the minus nineteen squared. So if you do that shortcut, make sure you do that. Divided by six point eight times ten to the minus fourteen all squared. I could cancel powers of 10, but good grief, I'm just too much effort right there. And we end up with, whoa, that's huge. 7.9 Newtons. Crazy. Never thought that it would be that big a force. <whistles> initial kinetic energy is five mega electron volts. We're going to have to turn that into joules. We know that. Show the magnitude of the initial momentum of each particle is that. Take the mass of the alpha particle to be that. Okay, so we have an energy but we're being asked for the momentum. It's one of those times where we're dealing with energy and momentum in the same question, and people often forget how to deal with this, but the trick is, is take your energy equation, kinetic energy that is half mv squared, and then times by m. me is equal to half m squared v squared, so therefore me is equal to half p squared. Therefore, rearranging this, we end up with p is equal to the square root of 2 Em. So it's going to be square root of 2 times, well, it's mega electron volts, so we need to do 5 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Minus 13 for mega electron volts, minus 19 just for electron volts. Times up by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 27. Tidying up powers of 10, why not? So this just ends up being 10, so we can just add that onto there. That ends up being 12, but then we have minus 27 and minus 12, so that just ends up being minus 39 instead. So square root of 1.6 times 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 39, and that gives us one point, well, 1.0 really, times 10 to the minus 19 kilogram meters per second on Newton seconds. Mark scheme, the first method they use, they go the long way around, they find the speed first from kinetic energy, but you know, hey, we made life easier for ourselves there. Maybe, I don't know. D, magnitude of the final momentum is equal to its initial value at A. Gold nucleus is initially at rest during the passage of the alpha particle from A to B. No other forces act on two particles. In the following questions, label any relevant angles. Okay. Draw two vectors in the spaces below to represent the initial momentum and the final momentum of the alpha particle. So that's P1. Final momentum at B, P2. I guess we call that PA and PB. 60 degrees, it was 60, right? Okay, wasn't being that accurate, but there we go. Not a good angle, but you get the idea. I draw a vector in the space below to represent the momentum when the alpha particle reaches B. Well, if we had this momentum to begin with, and then we have this momentum afterwards, then where has the extra vertical momentum come from? Well, it's because the gold particle, gold nucleus has been given, gold nucleus has been given momentum going downwards, so it's going to be the same angle, because we know that the vertical momentum of both is going to be equal and opposite. Oh, okay, explain how you determine this momentum. Initial vertical momentum equals zero, therefore is zero after. Also, therefore, vertical P for alpha and AU must be equal and opposite. And I guess we could go one step further. If total momentum of alpha is unchanged, it must have supplied horizontal momentum to the gold nucleus. I guess we could say one more thing. We could say, well, gain in momentum must be parallel with force at closest point. So there we go. That's it. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please leave a like. If you've got any questions or comments, put them below. And if you click on the card, it'll take you to the whole OCR past paper playlist. See you next time.